do this here. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us at the School of International Public Affairs and the Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, my name is Jason Bordoff, uh, Professor of Professional Practice here, and I direct the Center on Global Energy Policy. We're delighted to have Commissioner Neil Chatterjee from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission with us tonight. Um, I recall when I clerked on the DC Circuit Court of Appeals how, how upset my fellow clerks would get when they would get a FERC case because of how technical and boring <coughs> it was, but it doesn't seem that way any longer. FERC is at the heart of some of the uh, most profound changes in the energy system today that we've seen in decades from the rise of distributed energy and connected homes to the changes in our energy mix, the changes in uh, natural gas production and trade and infrastructure as a result of the shale boom. Questions about grid reliability and resilience, we'll talk about those. Questions about cybersecurity and much more. Those are the issues that we're here to talk about tonight. These are uh, highly consequential issues for the energy system, for the climate, for the economy. As such, they evoke an enormous amount of interest and even passion. And so I just want to remind everyone uh, tonight that the purpose of today's events, at, uh, as like all events at Columbia University, are to promote the free exchange of ideas in a respectful, civil, and rigorous way, uh, and through dialogue and exchange of facts and analysis, hopefully advance a shared understanding of the energy system. I see many of my students actually in the room today, and I know we've spent a lot of time recently talking about current policy issues like the recent uh, proposed rule from the Department of Energy to FERC to consider addressing concerns about grid reliability and resilience. I know how interested they all are in hearing Neil's views, uh, learning from him, engaging in respectful, sometimes challenging dialogue, even if uh, some may disagree with him. So towards the end of our program, we're going to have time for direct questions from the audience. So you all have a chance to ask Neil about what he said, give him a chance to respond, and have some of that dialogue and back and forth. So I'd please ask you to hold any uh, comments or reactions or questions until the end, and uh, everyone here will have a chance to weigh in with, uh, with the microphone that we have set up for questions. And for those watching online, you have the chance to ask questions of Commissioner Chatterjee as well, uh, using uh, the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle, Columbia U Energy. <coughs> uh, so with that, let me uh, briefly introduce Commissioner Chatterjee. He was nominated to FERC by President Trump in May 2017, confirmed by the US Senate in August, and served uh, for a few months as chairman. Prior to joining the commission, he was the energy and policy advisor to the US Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell. Uh, over the years, he's played uh, a role in passage of many major energy highway agriculture bills prior to serving with Leader McConnell, um, worked for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, began his career working with the House Ways and Means Committee, so he's worked on Capitol Hill for a long time, uh, is a native of Kentucky, uh, and we'll talk about that as well, a graduate of St. Lawrence University and the University of Cincinnati uh, College of Law. So please join me in welcoming Commissioner Chatterjee to Columbia University. Uh, Neil, uh, thanks for being with us uh, this evening. There's a me. lot to talk about tonight. And um, uh, just again, there's a lot of students here, a lot of people who are interested in careers in government and policy. I just want to start just by giving, I'd be interested, I think they'd be interested in hearing kind of how you came to be doing what you're doing now. You were raised in Kentucky, worked for Leader McConnell. Uh, talk about uh, how you came to work in policy. Was that, was that always an interest? And then to what extent does coming from uh, one of the most prominent coal states uh, affect the way that you thought about policy when you were working for Leader McConnell? Obviously, he had certain policy views on that issue. And then how, if at all, does that affect the way you view your role today as a FERC commissioner? Uh, yeah, thank you for the, for the question. So in terms of my background and how I get here, and I actually uh, get these questions a, a lot from students who have an interest in working in public policy, and I, I very much encourage that. I think it's so important, and uh, it's, uh, it's a commitment uh, to service and to country, and I think most of us uh, who work in this sphere are, are you know, regardless of uh, what angle we're coming at, um, are trying to do the right thing for the country, and I've always felt that. Um, my two loves in life were, uh, were kind of sports and politics, and my athletic career ended in the eighth grade <laughs> when I stopped growing, 
And so uh, um, I have always enjoyed public policy and politics because my dad enjoyed it. And uh, we would talk about it when I was a kid. And so um, when I had the opportunity to, uh, to come to Washington, um, I started as an intern and kind of worked my way up. Um, and because uh, I was you know, passionate about it and enjoyed the work, um, uh, I was fortunate uh, to be placed in some good situations, including um, you know, being from a small rural state, uh, having the ability to work for uh, the Senate majority leader, the Senate party leader uh, from my state um, was an incredible honor and opportunity. I think one of the um, underappreciated components of, uh, of Senator McConnell's historical contribution to our, to our uh, public policy discourse is he has enabled a lot of Kentuckians to, uh, 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 to be in uh, <coughs> positions where we can have an influence on public policy. And, and um, I'm one of the beneficiaries of, uh, of his generosity in pushing me forward for this opportunity. Uh, in terms of serving on the commission and how my uh, background and kind of uh, growing up uh, in Kentucky you know, has influenced me, um, you know, one of the interesting things is um, I initially came to Washington. I mentioned I did an internship. Um, I came to work in healthcare policy. Both my parents are in cancer research, and um, that was sort of their background. And so um, I had some familiarity with health policy issues, and I'd hoped to get a job um, in the health, health policy sphere. Um, I didn't really have a background in energy issues when I first started um, on Capitol Hill. Got an opportunity to, uh, to work for a congresswoman uh, for which the energy portfolio just happened to be the job that was available. And as I got into it, that's when I started to connect the dots between um, you know, my experiences uh, in Kentucky you know, growing up and how energy policy really is significant to people's lives in the Commonwealth. Um, I think you know, one of the things that is underappreciated about uh, the significance of, of coal to Kentucky is coal's not just an important part of uh, the economy, uh, and, and direct and indirect jobs there. Um, it's part of the culture and part of the, the, the lifeblood of the state. You've got communities in which you know, people have seen their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents um, earn a living in otherwise Im impoverished regions um, through the jobs tied to coal. And so you know, I, I certainly had that uh, sympathy when I came to Washington. Working for Senator McConnell, um, he was elected by the people of Kentucky to, to fight on behalf of the issues that are important to them. And his constituency, um, which relies upon um, uh, uh, coal-fired generation, um, encouraged him to, to fight on behalf of coal. And he did that. And I aided him in doing that. Um, but when I came to the commission, and as I make the transition from you know, Capitol Hill aid to <coughs> independent regulator, um, you know, I respect the independence of FERC. I respect the uh, quasi-judicial nature of the work that we do there. And despite the fact that I may have sympathy for the plight of coal communities in my home state, um, that doesn't factor into my decision making. And I know we're going to get into the, the uh, rulemaking from, from DOE Secretary Perry. Um, and I think that's an example of where the approach at FERC, the judicial nature of the work, evaluating things in a fact-based, evidence-based way, we work off the record. And, um, <coughs> I was able to set aside my personal experiences and feelings and evaluate the record fairly. And the ultimate conclusion that we came to, and we can discuss it in greater length, was that we unanimously agreed uh, to, uh, to reject the Secretary's proposal. Yeah, and I think that that took a number of observers, some at least, by surprise that the Commission acted in a unanimous way. I think there was a perception, at least from some, that this was a proposal by the Department of Energy for FERC to consider a rule. I mean, just so, so people know, I think many people do, uh, a, a proposal that to, aimed at, DOE said, strengthening the resilience of the US power market by providing financial uh, by su support for, uh, for plants that come with 90 days supply of fuel. Coal and nuclear uh, were the ones um, that people realized this would apply to. Uh, so people saw that as an effort to support coal, help coal, which was suffering economically, um, stay, keep these plants open. Um, but a unanimous decision uh, from, from, from all five commissioners striking that down, um, a rare show of bipartisanship in some sense in Washington, just give, give us a little bit of a sense of kind of behind the scenes um, how that came to pass. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm a little sensitive to the perception that people had that we were going to ignore the record and take action. And, and you know, again, I, I've acknowledged you know, some of the culpability that I had in that. I think when Secretary 
Perry initially unveiled his proposal, um, I admit, and I've been candid about it, I was initially sympathetic because of my past experience, not just growing up in Kentucky, but my time on Capitol Hill in which you know, I encountered lawmakers of all political stripes from all regions of the country who talked about the importance of fuel diversity and an all of the above approach to energy. And so that was the, the foundation with which I was approaching this. Um, but I was very, very clear up front that were the commission to take any action, it would have to be legally defensible and would not distort markets. I'm a firm believer in, in markets and in the markets that we've spent uh, two decades and, and, and enormous resources to develop. And I didn't want to do anything to, uh, to distort the markets. And I had to make sure that whatever we did was legally viable and legally defensible. And so as I mentioned, despite my sympathies for the plight of coal communities um, who are suffering from you know, the, the aftermath of the rapid transformation in our generation mix. And I do think that you know, we need to ensure that those communities are able to undergo this transition with dignity. Um, that wasn't a part of our record and wasn't something that we focused our decision on. Similarly, um, this exercise was also, you know, there was a perception that this was about propping up both coal and nuclear plants. Um, I believe in climate change. I believe climate change is occurring. I believe it's man-made. And I believe that we need to take steps to mitigate uh, and reduce carbon emissions. And nuclear power can play a significant role there. Nuclear power is our single greatest source of carbon-free generation. But similarly, despite my view that nuclear power is critical to reducing carbon emissions, that doesn't factor into our docket that's outside of the purview of the statutes that govern the agency. FERC is a market regulator. We had to look at market factors and come to our conclusion based on whether existing tariffs were unjust and unreasonable. <coughs> and I thought it was uh, clear from the record that what Secretary Perry was proposing did not meet that threshold. And it was absolutely appropriate for us to, uh, to set aside uh, <coughs> the rulemaking, but also to open a new docket in which we look at this question of resilience uh, and the, and the long-term safety and stability and reliability of the grid, but do it in a fuel-neutral way. Um, I think Secretary Perry asked the right question. I think he proposed the wrong remedy. And I'm hopeful that through our, our very careful, thoughtful, deliberative process at the commission, as we uh, work through this new docket, um, in a fuel neutral way, we will be able to assess whether in fact there are challenges in certain regions of the country that could pose a potential threat to resilience and then what steps we would need to, to, to mitigate those potential threats. I want, I want to ask you about resilience and, and reliability and, and, and what, what they mean and, and what issue we're trying to address. But just to say on the nuclear question for a minute, I mean that was, as you know, um, the way New, New York State uh, rationalize keeping open several of its nuclear plants and was talking about the social cost of carbon, the cost to society of climate change, and, and, and the value that zero carbon nuclear brought to the grid. Do you think FERC, is, there, is, that, is that a consideration for FERC when it thinks about regulating wholesale electricity markets? How, sh how if at all, should it be thinking about uh, zero carbon climate benefits of nuclear power when it thinks about rates? I think from the FERC perspective, as we will look at this, is you know, what is the impact that these various state policies having on markets? So you have different states taking different measures um, to, to you know, uh, maintain the generation mix that they believe works for their states and for their constituencies. And that is their prerogative. I think <coughs> FERC's role is to ensure reliability and the, and the proper functioning of markets, accounting for the, the market distortions that are occurring from these myriad state policies. When you, and, and so it, you, it was a unanimous decision. You supported the FERC decision. You also issued a statement acknowledging some disappointment, is maybe is the right word, that the commission didn't reach an interim position that would have provided some assurance that resilience wouldn't be jeopardized by the loss of baseload power plants. Um, what, what's your concern there? I mean, you said you had some sympathy for this when Secretary Perry proposed it, and you sort of talked about the decline of coal communities, but, but leaving that aside, just do you think there's a problem with reliability and resilience of the grid, and, and what do those two things mean, and how are they different? So I think we have to look at it, and I think that, uh, so, so reliability is FERC's you know, core responsibility. We want to make sure that when you hit the switch, 
the lights come on. I think the, the construct of resilience uh, could be a separate you know, construct from reliability, and, and that's something that we need to carefully evaluate through this new docket. And it could be that different regions of the country have different uh, challenges um, and, and different th potential threats to resilience. The reason I uh, had proposed an interim measure is, again, um, it was based on the record. I thought I saw enough in the record that gave me concern that in the time it would take to do the longer term analysis, there may be plants that are essential to resilience and reliability that if they were shut down due to short term market pressures during that interim period and we found out after the fact that they were actually necessary, we couldn't get them back. Once these plants are shut down, um, they're gone and that's an irreversible decision. And so uh, my concern was there and there, in my view, based on the record, there weren't sufficient uh, provisions within the existing tariffs to address some of these situations. Now, I want to be very clear. This was in no means a lifeline specifically to coal or nuclear. And the way that the order that I would have envisioned um, would have been structured, each of the individual RTOs and ISOs could come back, and if they made a determination that certain units, regardless of fuel source, were necessary for, uh, for, for, for reliability and resilience, they could have had a mechanism to amend their tariff to address that. That could have applied to coal and nukes, but also to gas, to renewables, to other sources of generation. It was a fuel neutral approach. Is the resilience concern about the changes in the fuel mix? Or I think as the record showed that was submitted to FERC, uh, there were many comments with, with data showing when we've had problems, it's been about severe weather, it's been about the transmission and distribution network, the wires go down, um, and even different forms of, of, of energy can have problems. Uh, pipelines can have problems, but coal piles can freeze. And, and uh, So is it about the fuel mix, or is, is that not the issue? I think it's about identifying what the potential risks to the grid are and making sure that we are accounting for those risks. With this rapid transformation of our grid, um, you know, there are new variables and new dynamics that are coming to it. Historically, you know, sort of the de facto approach has been we are prepared to you know, uh, uh, manage the grid in a way that in the event of the loss of a single generating source or a single uh, uh, transmission source that the grid could withstand that risk. As the grid transforms, I think it's worth looking at whether in fact there are new risks that we need to account for. As we become increasingly dependent on gas, uh, do we need to account for what happens if a pipeline goes out? as we become potentially increasingly vulnerable to cyber threats, do we need to account for the impact of the grid if, uh, if a cyber attack were to take out generating sources, if there were you know, cascading effects? These are all things that I think are worth carefully and cautiously examining in a fuel neutral way to make sure that we are uh, protecting the security and stability of the grid. So that to me is what it's more about than trying to pick winners and losers or prop up a certain fuel source. It's we've got these rapid transformations that are taking place. We have historically looked at protecting the grid through a certain lens. It's time that we look at these, these, these new factors that have arisen as a result of that rapid transformation. And you're sort of talking about risks that different fuels face. Again, pipeline problem, or it could be something else for a different fuel. Do you, but sometimes this is phrased as like we're moving from base load to non base load. And I guess, you know, it raises the question of what base load even means anymore when you think about gas plus renewables or storage plus renewables. And we've seen storage play a much bigger role, uh, even in California, when they had the Aliso Canyon methane leak and then tried to quickly make up for that supply and found that bids on storage played played a pretty economically attractive sure. role more than some people thought. So does the concept of base load matter? Or should we think differently? What does it mean? I think what we need to look at is, and as we do this uh, uh, careful assessment, is are there attributes that are you know, currently not being adequately compensated by the marketplace? And if we do that analysis and we find out that you know, uh, distributed energy resources coupled with storage can uh, uh, you know, provide that resilient power, it may not be an issue. That, that you know, gas can provide that resilient power, it may not be an issue. That gas coupled with, with, with renewables can ensure the resilience of the grid, it may not be an issue. But if we do find out that there are potentially attributes unique to coal and nukes, uh, and that we actually need those assets, but they're not, that value is not being accurately captured in the marketplace, um, I just want to find that out before this rapid transformation retires those assets. And I think we can do that in a, in a very 
careful, fuel-neutral way. Um, and again, I'm not going to prejudge any outcomes or tell you, you know, uh, how this is going to turn out. We're going to act based upon what's in the record. What do you think the role of storage and distributed generation can be in ensure enhancing reliability and resilience of the grid? Could be huge. Could be the absolute game-changing breakthrough. Um, you know, uh, uh, I've had the opportunity um, since coming to the commission uh, to go out to Fremont and um, uh, visit Tesla out there, and I've, I've seen the advancements that they're making um, into, uh, with, with, with their innovations. Um, it, it's really exciting, um, and it has the, the, the capacity uh, uh, to really be transformative. Um, I think uh, it's clear that you know, momentum is going in this direction, and I think over the course of the coming years and decades, we are going to see um, an ever-increasing um, uh, deployment and presence of, uh, of renewables and distributed resources on our grid, and I think that's a good thing, and that's an exciting thing. Um, I think we at the Commission need to make sure we do our part to figure out you know, what that role, what role storage will play. We're currently working to removing barriers to access and, and enabling storage to, to compete. We're going to have to figure out where storage works best, how it can be adequately compensated, and, and, and what role it could play. But it could be absolutely tremendous. I think the technology is there. The momentum is there. That transition and transformation is going to happen. The role that the commission needs to play is to ensure that as that transition is occurring, we maintain reliability. And I, I'm confident that the the coupling of technological innovation with the diligent review at the commission is that we can make that transition reliably. And, and so the next steps now, the RTOs and ISOs have been asked to submit information about resilience, 60 days, I think, and then 30 yes, days of public comment. Is that, what happens next? So then we'll, we'll, we will have, uh, I, I hope, a sufficient record to review. And uh, my colleagues and I will review that record and determine what, if any, steps are necessary to go forward. We may evaluate the record, I think, um, ISO New England, um, uh, I very much appreciate. They uh, did a fuel security study in which they did a very candid analysis of where their potential challenges may be. I'm hopeful that others will follow suit in doing that detailed level of analysis so that we have that kind of you know, compelling record in which to make a determination. But it's entirely possible, as my colleague, um, Commissioner Rich Glick, has alluded to, he has said that if we come to the conclusion of you know, examining the record and we find that there's not an issue here, uh, then we may need to move on. And I'm not going to prejudge any outcome. Um, like we did in considering the mm -hmm. NOPRA as submitted by DOE, <coughs> whatever decision we make going forward will be based on the record. Were your concerns about resilience and, and mitigated in any way by, you know, this guy's issue got a lot of attention with the polar vortex, and then in its January 8th order, FERC talked about a number of steps and actions it had taken to try to address some of those concerns. And then I, I think people saw with a dramatic, with a very severe cold snap, the system worked reasonably well, um, did, uh, does that make you any more comforted? I think the grid performed well, but it's too soon to come to any policy conclusions about you know, um, what worked and what functioned and um, you know, uh, what role different generating sources played through that cold snap. I think it's premature. I think we need to, to do that analysis and um, you know, see how the grid operated through this to, again, I think looking back to the experience of the polar vortex, that the, that experience, you know, the RTOs, the ISOs, the Commission, learn from that experience. You know, utilities, stakeholders, and I think we're better prepared for for this latest cold snap. I think we need to similarly learn how the grid performed, you know, in in great depth and detail. Um, and I look forward to that analysis. I don't want to jump to any conclusions in the immediate aftermath of the cold snap on on you know policy conclusions. You mentioned cybersecurity. Can you talk about how much of a concern that is for you and what FERC is or should be doing about it? You know, I think, I think cybersecurity is important. I think, you know, with um, technological innovation, which I wholeheartedly embrace and, and excited about, um, comes downside risk. And that downside risk can come in the form of increased cyber <coughs> vulnerability tied to that technological innovation. And so I just think that we need to be vigilant and, uh, and stay ahead of, uh, of ever-evolving cyber threats. Um, I think that uh, when it comes to cyber, the Commission will continue to work with, with NERC, uh, which, uh, which works on standards um, that, uh, that industry uh, uh, um, complies with to, to uh, combat uh, cyber threats and have those defenses in place. But I think the NERC standards are the floor, not the ceiling, and that we need to be vigilant to, uh, to stay ahead of these uh, ever 
uh, evolving threats. And cyber is just one of those areas where doing what is right is not necessarily always what's popular. And I think we have to be very careful as we, as we do our analysis, uh, evaluate the, the likelihood of a potential threat and what the consequences of that threat could be and, and, and come to a balanced solution on, uh, on staying ahead of it. And what are the other uh, uh, gr grid resilience, cybersecurity we've talked about, what are the other kind of big issues you see on the agenda that are going to be taking up most of your time? You know, I think there's a, there's a lot of critical issues before the commission. Um, I think, you know, uh, 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 transmission um, and, and looking at, you know, uh, what our transmission needs are, whether we need upgrades or to expand our transmission grid. I think as we see increased deployment of renewables, you know, getting the transmission piece right um, could be critical there. And I want to make sure that we have smart policies and smart um, incentives in place to ensure that um, we're, we're, we're building the necessary infrastructure that we need while protecting consumers. Um, and I think that'll be a critical focus. Um, I think that uh, uh, you know, one of the issues that uh, uh, is, is significant before the commission, Chairman McIntyre uh, announced uh, at our December open meeting that we would be revisiting um, our policy statement on pipeline uh, certificates. And I think that is no doubt um, a critical issue. I think we need to uh, uh, take a look at our processes, see what works, <coughs> see what, uh, what can be improved. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a very critical issue that um, I'm going to be taking very, very seriously. And uh, I'm going to be meeting with stakeholders all across the process to ensure that, uh, that their interests are heard. Let's stay on the pipeline issue. That's an important permitting uh, regulatory role for FERC. It's one that is of enormous interest uh, everywhere, but, but especially here uh, in, in, in this region and in, in the Northeast and in, in, in New York and the tri-state area. Um, as you said, in December, FERC announced a broader review of its pipeline approval process. What's the goal of that? What's your assessment of FERC's pipeline process? And what changes do you think might need to be considered? So um, I, I, for one, you know, um, am concerned about, you know, landowner protections. Um, you know, I think uh, there's an inherent tension in, you know, uh, working through our process to, to permit infrastructure, but doing it in a way that's sensitive to the concerns that, uh, uh, and, and private property rights that people have. I'm a firm believer in, uh, in, in landowner protections, and I want to find ways to improve our process to make FERC more user-friendly, if you will, so that landowners feel that, you know, they can engage with us and make sure that you know proper mitigating steps, whether rerouting or or, or beyond, um, are taken to uh, to to ensure that landowners' rights are protected. Um, beyond that, I think you know again we need to we need to look and see what the scope of the review will be um, and 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 what elements will be considered uh, to see where uh, improvements can be made to our process, identify what's working, and and find ways we can find uh, uh, you know you, you, you can always do better. There was also a D.C. Circuit Court opinion recently that said that as part of the environmental review process for pipelines, FERC needed to look at downstream implications, the emissions that come from actually using the fuel that moves through it. Um, what, what, uh, what, what, you mentioned climate change before. I believe it's real. It's man-made. How should FERC be considering climate change in its environmental reviews? So it's part of our review. Um, in that instance, uh, uh, the, the case was the Sable Trail case, um, in which the court ruled that, uh, that, that the record for FERC and the analysis was insufficient. Um, I think since that order, we've actually, in successive orders, improved upon that. And I actually think um, you know, there was another order, the Nexus order, that came out the same week that Sable Trail was issued. And in that order, I think we actually did do that thorough analysis that kind of <coughs> anticipated uh, some of the court's arguments in the in the Sable Trail case, and so I think uh, I think we do a pretty good job of uh, uh, in that environmental assessment. But um, as we review our process, you know, I'm always open to finding ways to to make improvements. And one of the concerns that people raise when they're thinking about climate impacts is the FERC <coughs> uh, undertakes an assessment of need, trying to look at the markets, the the buyers for for the fuel, um, and and. And a question that comes up is, well, if we're going to meet uh, targets of keeping emissions within, you know, keeping warming to two degrees, and what does that mean for the fuel mix that 
this is infrastructure that even if there's need now, um, there may not be or, or wouldn't be consistent with those targets for there to be down the road. Uh, is that something that FERC does think about or, or should think about? That gets complicated because it's outside of our statutory purview. You know, that, that, that question of, um, you know, how we are going to go about, you know, mitigating carbon emissions. <coughs> My colleague, Commissioner Cheryl LaFleur, the other day, um, I thought articulated it pretty well in which she said that if we're going to have a policy uh, uh, to combat uh, uh, carbon emissions, it needs to be a national policy, um, and that's superior to kind of on a case-by-case <coughs> -case basis at the commission tackling some of those issues. And so I do think that um, it will take, you know, uh, Congress or other agencies uh, to act here. It's kind of just outside of our, our, our purview. Um, that, that, that level of assessment. So talk about the criteria FERC does look at <clears throat> to evaluate these. And, and, and in particular, maybe you could comment on uh, one, one pipeline project that has been quite controversial is the Penn East uh, project that was just recently approved. There was one dissent, Commissioner Glick, who uh, said it, the developer hadn't <coughs> met the burden of showing uh, need because that need was demonstrated through affiliates, not sort of arm's length contractual relationships. Your, what, what were your thoughts about that? So um, I uh, issued a concurrence there in which uh, uh, I again expressed my concern um, for landowners. Um, in this particular instance, there had been, uh, you know, uh, uh, there hadn't been surveys of, uh, of, of, of land. Um, that had been conducted, and so I wanted it on the record that uh, that I had those concerns. But I actually did feel that, um, as did uh, uh, Commissioner Lafleur, who issued a similar concurrence, um, and my other two colleagues, we felt that there was a sufficient demonstration of need um, in this area based on uh, the level of subscription um, and uh, and the crit criteria we have to evaluate. And how do you think of the relationship between? FERC and states' rights when you're looking at issues like this. FERC, uh, in one case, overruled New York State decision to deny a water permit for a pipeline, but in another case said it wouldn't make that decision. So, so how, do, how do you think about the, the role states play versus FERC in, uh, in, these, in these decisions? So specifically to those two decisions, what we did in both instances was follow the law. And I think that's, that's important, the, the, the fact patterns and the circumstances in those two cases were different and in both cases we followed the law. Um, I'm a firm believer in states rights. I believe that uh, uh, state and, and, and local <coughs> officials ought to make determinations uh, about their energy futures um, and, uh, and, and don't believe in, in, in a heavy hand of federalism. Uh, that said, you know, FERC has a responsibility to ensure reliability and to oversee um, wholesale markets, and when state policy decisions impact the, the, the markets that we oversee or reliability, we have to weigh in. And, and, and just extend that to sort of the power markets, if um, I'm just interested in this relationship between FERC and the states, the growth of distributed energy resources, which exist primarily as a customer device, but increasingly interact with wholesale markets, um, in some ways are beginning to blur the line between retail electricity, which is regulated by the states, and wholesale electricity regulated by FERC. Um, who's on the front lines of that, and how, does, how should that relationship work? So I think, again, I want to be careful because we've got a, you know, a, a couple of pending items before us. We have an uh, you know, open docket on distributed energy resources, an aggregated DER, um, as well as on storage. And so, you know, and, and so people know the ex parte rules prevent you from commenting or discussing pending matters. So. Correct, Understood. and I also should have made clear early on that I'm speaking, um, you know, these are my own views and, and not the views of, uh, of the commission. Uh, I needed to get that out up front. But um, no, look, I think, uh, um, I, I think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the role the commission is going to play as we, you know, undergo this, uh, this, this exciting transition is to ensure that reliability is maintained as, uh, um, as we work towards this transition. What um, we saw the president last night in the State of the Union talk about the importance of infrastructure, energy as a part of that. Um, FERC is also responsible for doing environmental reviews and permits around LNG export infrastructure. Uh, are there any 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 thing we should expect down the road there that would have change in any way how that process works, or or is there an effort to try to make things work more quickly, consistent with a policy objective of expediting infrastructure? 
I actually missed it. Uh, Kentucky <laughs> played Vanderbilt last night. And the guy hit two free throws with no time left on the clock to send in an overtime and then hit a shot with four seconds left to win it. So I was a little bit preoccupied. But um, I actually haven't, I, I don't have much clarity as to what the administration is going to unveil in terms of infrastructure. Um, there was some reporting around a leaked document that had, you know, some parameters of what an infrastructure package. I guess the question like, is, does that, does that really affect know. in any way how FERC thinks about its role? You, it is an independent agency, but you have an administration that has a policy objective of expediting the building of energy infrastructure. Does that have any impact on how you think about the way you do business, the way you do environmental reviews? Not unless they change the law. Um, and if they can compel Congress to, to pass something that, uh, that changes statute, then we would have to see what that statutory change would mean for the way we do things. But absent that, just having a proposal out there, we're an independent agency, and I think um, all of my colleagues intend to adhere to that independence. And so absent a statutory change, I don't think it will, it will uh, it'll change the way we approach things. What did you think of the, this is not so much like a FERC commissioner question, it's just more like, as you mentioned earlier, someone who grew up in Kentucky has sympathies for what's happening in coal communities. We've done analysis at the Energy Center, I, tell me if you agree with this, showing that the primary driver of the decline of coal has not, most, has not been regulation, it's been market forces, especially cheap natural gas. Um, and, 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 and so the promise to bring coal jobs back, uh, my reaction, I'm just making an editorial comment for a minute, you know, that sort of, and this is not partisan, I think both parties uh, have not always um, been uh, put, put front and center as much as they could policies and proposals to say, look, these are just uh, communities that are in structural decline because of market forces. Uh, they've spent decades producing energy that's powered the U.S. economy. We owe it to them to think about ways to rebuild those economies and diversify those economies. Is that, is that not getting enough focus? And, 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 and should we be saying that we can bring these jobs back? I think that's so important. And I think, again, uh, I don't think it's um, inconsistent to both care deeply about the environment and about the plight in these communities. Uh, these are communities where in a lot of instances there are no alternative employment. There's not a Walmart or a Burger King for 30 miles where someone can get other work. And so you're confronted with the choice of, you know, you know what do you do when the, when the jobs go away? And in many instances, the only assets that people have are their homes, and their homes lose value because no one's going to move to an area where there's no economic hope. So it really is devastating what's occurring in, in some of these regions that are, are, that are really you know, facing the painful elements of this transition. And I do wish um, we did focus more on that and find ways to provide uh, solutions um, to enable these <coughs> communities to, uh, to make this transition. And what's interesting, I think if you talk to people in these communities, they also deeply care about the environment um, and, and, are, and are concerned about environmental protection. But they're also concerned about their entire way of life, in many instances for you know, multi-generational um, uh, going away. And, and you can understand and, and, and have that concern. And so I, yeah, I, I do wish all of us, not just Congress, not just the administration, um, you know, uh, uh, academia, all of us in society need to, uh, to collectively think through, you know, what can we do to both protect our environment and ensure that people aren't <coughs> left behind and really devastated in the process. As you, sir, I mean, the energy system is changing so fast. The, what shale is doing, the U.S. is just any day now going to pass 10 million barrels a day of oil production, the highest in U.S. history, gas markets. But I think the power sector might be changing faster than anything else. When you roll the clock forward a decade, what do you think the biggest changes are going to be to the power sector and the resource and fuel mix, the extent of distributed resources, um, the ability to introduce sol uh, storage at scale, uh, the role renewables are going to play. Um, what are things going to look like, and what does that mean for policy actions or FERC actions today? I think renewables, renewables, renewables. I think um, you know the the, the <coughs> momentum is clearly there. Um, I think as as costs come down, as technology improves. Um, I, I do think that breakthrough in storage um, uh, could be transformational. But you know, irregardless of that, I think there is no question in my mind that we're going to see uh, a, a dramatic uptick in the deployment of renewables. Um, and I think that's exciting. And, uh, and, and again, I think I look forward to, to playing the role that I can uh, at the commission that, you know, in, in, in maintaining reliability as we make that transition. So uh, we have about 15 or so minutes left for questions. I'm going to open it up. Uh, I think people are going 
to the microphone. Is that right, Jesse? Going, we're using this microphone here. So are people coming up and standing here? Or are we passing it out? Sorry. OK, so, uh, so if folks <coughs> who, who have questions could um, come and, and stand at the microphone, please, which allows us to more ap easily capture the question on our, uh, uh, for, for those online as well. Ask you to please uh, just briefly introduce yourself. Please keep it in the form of a question, not, uh, not, not uh, a speech or, or, or a lengthy statement of beliefs and positions. Um, and uh, give Commissioner Chatterjee a chance to respond. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm uh, Larry Shapiro. Um, your concurrence uh, uh, in Penn East was very brief. And um, I was just wondering, uh, the eminent domain issue was obviously a lightning rod in a lot of ways. And I was just wondering if you could expand a bit, uh, not related to Penn East, but more broadly about what you think might be done in order to uh, address landowner concerns? Yeah, I think, you know, as we evaluate our, our, our process going forward, um, you know, again, I don't yet have any clarity from the chairman on what form or structure or scope our underlying pipeline <coughs> review will take. But regardless of that, I, you know, this is, this is a point that I'm going to continue to hammer upon. Um, I want to meet with, uh, with, with landowner groups get their you know, concerns, you know, kind of work through it, and find better ways that we can, we can have better engagement, ensure that people's voices are being heard, <coughs> that their concerns are being addressed. Make sure that landowners are uh, aware of the, the, the mechanisms within our process to, uh, 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 you know, to, to mitigate impacts, rerouting, and the like. Um, so this is just an, it's an issue that you know, is of great concern to me. I thought. Penn East was an example where I was uncomfortable about the lack of surveys that had occurred. And you know, I want to really find that, that balance and that inherent tension in encouraging cooperation, but ensuring that landowners have adequate protection. Thanks. Um, next question, please. Hi. <coughs> Sorry. Wow. Very close. Uh, my name is Jessica Roth. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Engagement at Riverkeeper, and I have a somewhat many pointed question that will all come together. Um, but you talked a lot about fuel neutrality and doing analyses about resilience and about our grid and moving forward with energy. Um, and you also talked about the need to fight or to work towards um, lowering carbon emissions. But obviously, we also have to be considering other greenhouse gases, including and specifically methane, which is 86 to 120 times more potent than actually carbon dioxide in the end when we're talking about these. Obviously, the natural gas system that we have in place is an extreme emitter of those gases, which leads to problems not just for the climate, but also for the public health and welfare of communities. I was struck when you said that your parents were cancer researchers, that you are not at all, as an agency, ever considering issues of public health. I mean, I personally know dozens and dozens of people, and people in this room know hundreds and thousands of others who live near fossil fuel infrastructure and are having all kinds of, of health crises as a result of it. And so I just would like you to address how you put those together to do a real analysis, because I would clearly beg to differ that I don't think you're doing enough of a climate sure. change analysis when you're approving every single natural gas project that comes your way. So uh, you know, a couple of things on that. I, I, I do think it is unfair to say that we approve every project. Okay, Jordan Cove. So, but, but, but beyond that, there, there, there are numerous projects, project submissions that are withdrawn because they don't meet the rigors of our process. We do have a very rigorous and robust process. And I think um, you know, that, that is lost on this idea that we just approve everything that comes through. People don't see when projects are submitted and then withdrawn. Um, in terms of health impacts, of course I care about health impacts, and yes, um, having parents who have spent their lives combating cancer, um, I'm, you know, I'm familiar enough with, you know, the the, the science uh, uh, to know these impacts. But that's, you know, like in the same way, my my sympathy for the the plight of people in coal communities doesn't factor into my decision making at the FERC. We don't have anything within, you know, our the statutes that govern us uh, that ad that addresses the the health analysis. Uh, you know, we don't have the expertise at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to do that health analysis. But you are right. analyzing need versus harm. And how is that not a harm? Uh, again, as, as we work through our process, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly going to be cognizant of these things. And I want people to recognize that you know, 
<coughs> this is falling on deaf ears. You know, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive to, to these concerns and considerations. Um, and that, you know, if there are going to be changes to our process to, you know, expand the scope of our review, those need to be statutory changes. Um, for right now, we've got to abide by the law and the statutes that, that govern us and work within the parameters of, um, of, of the statutes that, that govern the agency. We have, we have always long, push the limits. We have a long line. Uh, I'm going to make sure everyone gets a chance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your, uh, your opinions. Uh, my name is Tim Graytack. I'm an analyst with Lux Research working on their energy storage desk. Um, I did have a, I wanted to ask you your opinions about and the status of the NOPER regarding uh, the energy storage and aggregation work, but it sounds like since that's in the midst of everything, you won't have, be able to issue an opinion I about I can't it. talk about timing um, okay. or how that will transpire. I will say this, this is one area where um, my perception of where things were prior to confirmation um, didn't line up with the reality when I got in the building. I had committed to Senator Markey of Massachusetts and Senator Whitehouse of Rhode Island that I would um, act expeditiously on the, on the storage rulemaking once I got confirmed to the commission. I promised them that I would do that, and then I got to the commission and realized it wasn't quite as far along as I had thought. Uh, but I've been working very aggressively with, uh, with the talented staff at the commission to move it as quickly as we can. And so without making any predictions on timing, I will tell you that it is a high priority for me, and I have stressed that um, to the chairman as well. Um, both the storage piece and Commissioner Glick and I have talked about the aggregated DER piece as well and ensuring that that, uh, that is appropriately considered. Wonderful. Um, and one quick follow-up. Uh, the work uh, on a secondary um, point, you had mentioned uh, analysis <coughs> regarding uh, the resiliency and reliability of the grid, um, specifically not just fuel diversity but also energy storage and the like. Um, what does that analysis look like and how granular is it? Are you getting into like LMP modeling? Um, or, uh, or forecasting elements, or is it all sort of? We've got to see what comes back. You know, okay. uh, again, so the RTOs and the ISOs have 60 days to submit their comments, and then we have a 30-day reply period. Um, I'm hopeful that you know that that high-level analysis will come through in that process. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Next question. Hi, my name's Kemley. I'm an intern with Food and Water Watch. I was really happy to hear you talk about the role that renewables will play in the future. However, I don't see the point if you believe in renewables and know that it's an important resource to have and an important way to fuel the grid, why are you supporting pipelines? They're so expensive to build. They cost nearly a billion dollars. And we're like, because <coughs> meth or natural gas and oil, even coal, they're finite resources and they're gonna run out in 50 to 110 years depending on the fossil fuel. Why are you supporting them and why aren't you pushing more to use renewable energy? So. It's not the, 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 the commission's a market regulator. We don't favor certain fuel sources or disfavor others. Um, we ensure you know, that, that the markets function and reliability. And you know, under our statutes and the laws that govern us, um, when applications are submitted, if they're lawfully submitted, we have a rigorous process that we go through. And if they're lawfully submitted applications, we have to follow the law and approve them. If, if you seek changes, which you're absolutely entitled to do so, and you, you raise some very valid points, it's Congress that needs to change the laws. Um, we have to abide by the statutes that govern us. Just, just a quick follow up, because I'm going to get to the rest of the questions. It, did you oh, have yeah. A, um, so the Williams Pipeline, which is be, being um, propo or the proposed Williams Pipeline in New York Harbor, by building the pipeline, we'd be affecting a bald eagle's nest, and that's against New York, or not New York, U.S. law. But are you, why would you support that pipeline? Or? I, then, let's move to the next question after. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, the underlying circumstances. I'm sorry. Thank you for the question. Hi, I'm Robert Wood. Um, you keep bringing up this issue of, of how you're a market regulator, and yet the D.C. Circuit of Appeals Court just ruled that FERC has to start taking climate change into consideration. So I'm struggling to reconcile these two things in my head. You, you've been given essentially a directive at this point to take something that is beyond the market into consideration, and yet we keep hearing about <coughs> the market. And the second part of my question is uh, regarding the affiliate partnerships that came up earlier. Um, it's widely reported that you often approve pipeline uh, contracts from companies that are essentially selling pipeline capacity to utilities that they also own. 
and they're awarded with a 14 percent, something like a 14 percent return on equity with these projects, which virtually guarantees their profitability regardless of demand. Um, when you couple that with what I think is a, na a nationwide capacity average of something like 50 percent for these pipelines, how are we to believe that these things are being built not for profit but for demand? And then, let me just, uh, so at one addition to the line, so I think it will be, uh, if we're quick, we can get through the remaining questions, but I'll just uh, yeah, I'll ask people not to add to the queue we have. Uh, very quickly, um, as I said earlier, you know, the Sable Trail decision did say that Burke needed to do more you know, of analysis of downstream GHG emissions. I, I mentioned that I thought in subsequent orders after Sable Trail, we did do a better job of, of doing that analysis, and I think um, we are doing that robust analysis, and we'll continue um, to build upon that. In terms of you know need, again, it's uh, uh, some of my colleagues are expressing some of the same concerns that you had. Commissioner Glick mentioned that in his dissent on pennies. Um, I have tremendous respect for him, and, and I'm going to work for him, uh, work with him. Um, you know, in in terms of you know market need and these contracts, you know, there have been projects that the commission has approved before. It didn't get built because the market determined that that need wasn't there. Um, and so I think that market mechanism of determining <coughs> need works. But again, it's something that I'm, I'm certainly open to, to further dialogue on. And I'm uh, uh, and, um, and expecting Commissioner Glick to push this dialogue. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Dallas Goldtooth, campaigner with the Indigenous Environmental Network. Um, it, it was good to hear that you that you support and recognize analysis that incorporates landowner rights, but there should also be um, support and consideration of indigenous rights. And when can we see complete analysis based on direct and indirect impacts on communities and environment that tribes are fighting to protect? And I have a follow up, but that's one. Uh, so uh, again, um, you know, I, I apologize in advance, like on some of the specifics, um, I, I'm just not you know familiar enough with it, but. Um, Obviously, when I say that I have sensitivity to landowners, you know that that extends to, to everyone. But I, I just can't competently speak to, to the underlying issues. Um, um, within, I just haven't had occasion thus far and had the bandwidth in my time at the commission to, to address it. Just quick on the follow-up, since we have people yeah. waiting. Yeah, as you may know, earlier this morning, other folks, <coughs> there was an explosion in Ohio on the Rover Seneca lateral pipeline, part of the Rover system, Rover um, pipeline system. Um, Rover Pipeline, owned by Energy Transfer Partners, has already received a plethora of penalties, including in the second work stoppage by FERC. Um, they've acquired over $2.4 million in penalties. Why won't FERC take the next step to, put, to stop this project? And when are we going to see some greater aversion from supporting a company that already has a horrible track record in what they do with, in the Dakota Access Pipeline and, and the transgressions against indigenous peoples and indigenous rights? Thank you. I'm going to speak, you know, broadly to it because I don't want to comment specifically on Rover. But what I will say is, uh, uh, I think FERC has a robust <coughs> enforcement process and a, and a very strong enforcement team that uh, that that does its job and does its job well. And without getting into some of the specifics here, um, I do think that uh, that FERC enforcement on matters like the one you described does uh, does a does a strong job. Next question, please. Commissioner, thank you for coming to speak to us. I really appreciate you coming here. Uh, my name is Valid Abu Ghazal. I manage uh, large capital allocations for oil and gas. And my question, I hope, is a very simple one, is most of our investment is in infrastructure, uh, large projects and such. Um, I hear everybody speaking about cybersecurity, cybersecurity, and, but I don't quite understand what's being done on the government side or if there's some sort of cooperation between y'all and us to make sure that the next sort of infrastructure is um, cyber secured. So yeah, so you. we've got, you know, we've got a multi-pass surprise. I mentioned we work, work with NERC on standards, but then we've also got an office at the commission, the Office of Energy Infrastructure Security, that works with stakeholders, works with law enforcement, works with other government agencies um, to stay ahead of these threats, to make sure that we're having that robust communication. And there is, the, there is you know, uh, uh, extensive communication between stakeholders and project developers, and uh, not just the commission, but other entities responsible for our cyber defenses. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Final question, please. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Michael Lapidus of Goldman Sachs. First of all, 
I want to echo my uh, predecessors. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Very informative. Much appreciated. Um, second, as a uh, family friend of the Calipari's from his days in Memphis, congratulations on last night. <laughs> um, still mad at you for taking them from us. Um, Congress and the administration passed what many view as, as a significantly impactful tax reform package towards the end of last year. That package probably complicates and adds to the FERC's workload mm -hmm. in the coming months or years as lots of asset owners likely have to revise their rate structure, um, whether it's individual pipelines, whether it's storage facilities, whether it's transmission lines or transmission companies. Just curious if you and your colleagues as commissioners are, are having a discussion about whether to make this a big blanket docket with a standard policy and practice for how you want companies you regulate and oversee to implement some of the changes and some of the consumer benefits that will come from the tax reform package, or whether you're more likely to do this on a one-by-one, -one, asset by asset, and do you worry about that impacting the workflow, not just on implementing tax law changes, but broader workflow across the FERC and across your staff? Thank Good you. Good question. Thank you for your point and your question. On your point, um, you know, uh, about Coach Calipari, uh, I would point out in the 2008 national championship game, you had a seven point lead with two minutes left and missed eight free throws. If you make four of those eight free throws, he probably is still at Memphis today. So uh, I, I apologize for that. But <laughs> um, in terms of your, your, your very serious and, and, and well framed um, question on the tax policy implications, look, this is the first time we've had to deal with this since, you know, 1987, you know, in the aftermath of the 86 reforms. Um, you know, from my understanding, it's a little bit easier, you know, on the electricity side where you have formula rates versus stated rates. Um, my colleagues and I are, are going to be discussing this. We are currently wa working, uh, waiting on guidance from the staff on what the options may be. And so um, while we wait for the expert opinion on what the options may be, they probably will run the gamut for, like you said, a, a generic proceeding to something more specific. Um, at this stage, it's pretty early in the process. We don't have any, you know, kind of, um, I can't predict which direction this will take. But it's obviously something that we're, we're taking uh, very seriously. And, and just so people understand the, the issue, this is the question of because the corporate tax rate has been lowered and utility uh, taxes will be lowered, that, that cost of service uh, comes down and, and right. whether, whether that benefit is passed through to consumers in the rate structure. Sure. So in my home state of Kentucky, but, you know, it's a regulated market, the Kentucky PSC um, has already taken measures to, to, to reduce rates um, and factor that into their analysis. Um, but to your point, when it comes to transmission, when it comes to, to, to pipelines, it's, it's more complicated. And I think that's why we need to, to wait on the expert opinion of the staff. But fair to say consumers will see some benefit in their rates? From I mean, I, again, it's, it's so complicated. I don't, I, I don't want to get ahead of, uh, uh, of the, the chairman of the staff. Uh, so we're just uh, one or two minutes over. Um, Thank you all for being here. Thanks for engaging in this dialogue with uh, Commissioner Chatterjee and hearing uh, his thoughts about lots of issues in the power sector today. Uh, it's changing so quickly that we'll have much more to talk about very soon. I hope you'll come back and join us again at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. I uh, hope you'll all join us at our next upcoming events next Thursday in our What's Next on Climate series. We'll go deep with a panel discussion on energy access, development, and climate change. And then the following Tuesday, February 13th, the Energy Information Administration will be here to present their Energy Outlook 2018. Uh, please join me in thanking Commissioner Chatterjee for being with us today. Thanks for having me.